Um, yeah, otherwise I just thought uh, not to give a seminar. So maybe after five and a half or so years, I thought maybe it's time. So yeah, I just put together some stuff I had already anyway. So uh, I wasn't sure what kind of people would be here today. So since it's just C4DM, this slide is a bit silly. But anyway, so uh, one slide about me. Um, I have a background in computer science and mathematics. I did my PhD in 2012 at the University of Bonn, the Max Planck Institute. And I came here uh, for a postdoc and a fellowship and became 20, 2015 a lecturer. Uh, then in 2016, then Emmanuel, Bob, Dan, and me founded the Machine Listening Lab, and we made this beautiful picture back then. Uh, and yeah, soon I will be, although it was a great time, I will be leaving soon. So, uh, before I start, of course, thanks to my PhD students, uh, Daniel, Delias, Singh, and Tim. Um, but let's start. So, I was just talking about the machine listening lab, so what is machine listening? In machine listening, we essentially like a lot of people actually in C4DM, we, we kind of try to teach a computer to understand sound the way we do, just that in the machine listening lab, we focus in particular on machine learning, signal processing, numerical optimization, and statistical modeling. So for today, I will pick a subset of that, um, or what that could mean, in particular, how we can use regularization and relaxation to in induce some structure into models, and why we would want to do that, and how we can do it. And of course, we start with neural networks, because yeah, that's how we, um, that's what everyone is most interested in these days. I wasn't actually sure on what to start with. I should start with something that's not done and ready yet, or something that's already there. I was unfortunately a bit lazy and uh, just went with the stuff that was already there, but maybe to give a brief outlook. So uh, we started doing some little bit around connections, temporal classification. Um, some initial stuff is implemented. So if you don't know what that is, it's essentially a, a recurrent neural network and you have um, an alignment process on top of it that replaces the uh, alignment process. Start, we started implementing that and uh, some initial progress on that. Then another thing of what we've been working on for a while now uh, is a new t it's using proximal methods for neural networks, which uh, solves certain types of generalizability issues. We'll come back to proximal methods, actually. But let's start talking about the first uh, what I actually want to talk about, and that's structure and generative models. But let's start at the beginning. So neural networks, what does work these days? That's supervised learning. So in supervised learning, we have our neural network, which is a parametric function. Depending on how we set these parameters here, the function does something, whatever we want in a way. And we have an input, which is a vector. The function generates an output. Then we have some ground truth, and then we have a loss here, and we train it such that the output becomes as close as possible to the ground truth. So that's what currently is working quite well, and that's what the industry is using. But there's one problem, and that is that the ground truth creation can be quite expensive. Um, so for many interesting problems, we just can't do it this, in this way. And there are a few concepts how you get around that problem. And one of them are weak labels. So in weak labels, we're just kind of lazy. So let's say we want to build a frame-wise car detector. So usually, if we want to have really high quality labels, we would, um, we would need to label each and every frame, for example, in the video, saying, here's a car, and maybe even where is the car. Of course, it takes ages. If you have 25 frames per second or so, so in weak labels, we would just take, for example, a clip like this and just label the entire clip with, yeah, there, yes, there's a car. But as you can already see, 
some of these, th th there might be a problem, right? So if we use this clip here in um, supervised learning for frame-wise car detector, we would essentially ask the network to see something in there that just isn't there, right? There is no car in this frame. So using weak labels of the, so this kind of weak labels essentially introduces some kind of noise in the system. And sometimes neural networks, that can actually be a good thing. In this case, it turns out that in many cases, it's actually a bad thing. So what people have been doing is something that's intuitively quite clear. So you start training in naively with all frames in all clips set to car, for example, with the correct label car. So we get the first initial uh, neural network. And then we just let the neural network run on the test data set. And for some frames, it will be pretty sure there's no car. So we just relabel those frames, for example, this one, and tell it, yes, that's correct. That isn't a car, just assuming that if it's really sure, then it will be correct. Then we relabel re these frames and iterate the training process. And that helps a little bit, but not really that much. And it's pretty clear why. Because if we train naively with all these frames, it seems the network got already the information to find out, okay, in this frame, there is no car. So if we really tell it, yeah, you're right, there's no car, it's not that much new information, right? So in practice, this helps a little bit, but next to nothing. So how can we take this uncertainty in the labels really into account? And we thought, hey, okay, overall this is quite difficult with supervised learning because by definition, you always need a really clear target. So idea, treat weak label training, first of all, fundamentally as an unsupervised learning problem, and then use weak labels somehow as a guidance to encourage some structure in these learned representations, and then maybe do something with the learned representations later. But how? So one idea to do that. And this was kind of inspired by something Dan did some time ago. Um, so how do, what is the most common way to do unsupervised learning these days with neural networks? Um, the most common way is the autoencoder. And that, in this case, we have some kind of input, which is a vector, the first network here, which has got the, the encoder network. And that produces an output R, which is typically lower dimensional or sparse. Then there's a second network, which uses this representation as input and generates this output. And then you train it such that this input becomes as close as possible to the output. So that what it essentially is doing is taking this vector and squeezing it together so you, get, you learn the lower dimensional representation of that input. For us now, the problem is that this thing here is typically completely unstructured. We cannot interpret that. It's just something. If it's very low dimensional, you hope that the dimensions are kind of orthogonal, but to, to interpret that, it's usually hopeless and usually no one really tries. But now the idea is to use these weak labels to modify this learning so that we get structure exactly there. So how do we do that? So we take this learned representation and first we associate each unit in there with a certain class. The simplest case, this could be, for example, this unit can be used to describe cars, this one to describe trees, and this one clouds. In general, you would usually have more than one unit per class, and you might have some free units that can be used just for general background modeling or whatever. This is like the most basic concept to do this. And once we have this association, we create a label matrix, which essentially encodes the weak labels in a binary form. So for example, we have, uh, so this is our entire database, the number of all frames, video frames or whatever. And here we have one weak label telling us, okay, these frames, maybe there's a car. Yeah, we got the label car for that clip. Here maybe it's a tree, there's a clown. And for the others, we have zeros. Assume it's not active. <laughs> So yeah, so the label information in binary form. And now we modify this autoencoder learning structure. And we add this second penalty here. We call that activity penalties. And 
it, it's quite simple. So let's assume in a frame I, we know a car is, we assume a car is not active. So the corresponding entry for that unit, so this is the same length, will be uh, zero. This is a vector for one, so one minus zero, this will be one. Multipl multiplied element-wise with the output of these things, yeah, so with the learned representation. That means, and, and this is something we want to minimize, right? So if there is any activity in the unit that is zero, we will penalize this uh, activity using this term. If we know in a frame is a car, this will be one, so one minus one, we completely ignore the, the corresponding value of the unit here, and so the network can essentially do whatever it wants. Yeah. Uh. So, the problem, so this kind of already worked, right? So we just let this run, we essentially penalize activity in units we know should be inactive, but it led to a problem, and that was that this is really difficult to train. Why is that? So when you think about this, let's say the network is trained, fully trained. So what we so we so maybe the values here for inactive classes are kind of low, yeah? So it, it's kind of alright. So what we want is to really squeeze it down. That means this balancing parameter, which essentially tells us how, um, how important is that reconstruction loss and how important is this loss. This needs to be really high so that this term becomes really important. But if we start with this, yeah, let's say this is really strong, the entire loss function will initially be dominated by this. Yeah? So when we initialize the network ran with random weights, and what happened in practice is if we make this really strong, the only so the network was just trying to, to really avoid this, making an error against this term. So what happened is that the only thing this network learned was setting the output of this thing to zero. So everything was zero. Because then you don't make any mistake here, and we take that error into account. On the other hand, if this is too low, we don't get any structure here, we essentially get a normal autoencoder. So one way around that is a learning schedule. So we can, for example, start with something low here, and then slowly increase it. That is something you don't want because then it takes ages. Yeah? So first of all, you don't know, if, or in general, if you increase this too quickly, it doesn't converge. If it's too slow, it takes ages. How quickly you have to increase this over time during learning completely depends on the data, on the data set, statistical properties, on the network architecture, who knows what. So there's no rule of thumb how this should really, there's no optimal way to schedule this parameter. So we came up with a different way to accelerate this, and we called it structured dropout. So maybe you've heard about normal dropout in neural networks. So a new normal dropout in neural networks, essentially, but ignore the structure for now. The normal dropout, you have a vector here during training, which is binary, but random binary noise. So what is happening here is, for example, if we have a dropout in the autoencoder, is that random entries here are set to zero, and that essentially encourages the network to not rely on certain units to be present, which makes it more robust, because it's essentially forced from a statistical point of view to make the most important information redundantly available in here, so we can make use of the available capacity. So we, it's harder to... Um, to overfit. But we don't do that here. We have a structured dropout. So we, what we essentially did, we replaced this penalty here and took this binary vector here, which is structured, it's our label matrix. We put it in there, right? So what is happening now is, let's say car is inactive. So this is again a pointwise multiplication. The corresponding unit will be set to zero because we know it's not active. That means this network here can learn right from the start to represent the input just with the classes that are actually active. So it doesn't need to deal with all the noise that initially comes from that. So this train for this part is accelerated drastically, but also this part, because when you think about it, which is now similar to normal dropout. 
So let's say we have this reconstruction loss here. And now the error is back propagated. So it goes through here. When you have a zero here, this error information is blocked. It doesn't go through. But if, if you have a one, essentially all the error information is channeled, and suddenly you're affecting the parts of this network much more strongly that are really responsible for the active classes. So it accelerated both drastically, and not just by a little. Um, so in our specific application, I don't want to claim it's always the case, but just to give you a, a rough feeling, we tried to optimize it using scheduled learning, and then we did it this way, and this was faster by a factor of 10,000. So not percent, by factor. So it made quite a bit of a difference. Okay, summary faster convergence. Um, so how do we show now that this actually makes sense and works? This is not a classifier yet, right? So what we could do, we could train and learn this interpretable representation, then maybe put a classifier on top, and then do some classification stuff. But of course that adds some added complexity to the whole thing. So we decided to do it in a more direct way. You don't use optimize it, but you don't change the links for a single input, or do you use a batch? It was full batch training in this case. So I've everything in the batch is labeled the same way? Ah. Um, uh, no, no, no. No, uh, you, you will see, in a, just in a second, how, I, uh, how it was actually evaluated. Just a second. So the application was source separation. And uh, so in source separation, you might have seen this before. The goal is here's some kind of mixture of um, some instruments. And then you have a black box, and it separates you into, it gives you a separated result for the individual instruments, which is pretty difficult. And in most cases, until, unless you really know something like which instruments are there, something, it doesn't work. So what we did is incorporating some guide, guiding information in the form of a score, so we at least roughly know which instruments are active and which notes they are roughly playing. We don't know exactly where the notes are being played. We don't know any spectral information. We don't know how loud or whatever, but it's useful information, of course. So we use that as side information to help the entire separation process. So how, we, how do we do that here? So we have the score, and first we transform it into the binary label matrix. And we have, in the simplest case, we have one unit per instrument and pitch, but it could be usually more, right? But in the simplest case, it kind of looks like uh, a quantized uh, piano roll representation of the score. And that is our binary label matrix. Input is a magnitude spectrogram, or initially, individual frames from that. Then we train it first with structured dropout, and then with activity penalties. We have to do this because with this alone, the network does not need to learn to actively set the inactive classes to zero because it can always rely on this thing telling it what is active and what's not. And once the network's trained, we can do the following. We have, the, we have some kind of input. We send it through the network to get a learned representation, and this is now interpretable. And now, for example, we can only keep the information for the nodes that I, we can choose. For example, the right hand, the, the nodes played by the right hand in the piano piece, and we set the information for all the other nodes to zero. Send this modified representation through the decoder network, and it just generates the part of the spectrogram that actually belongs to these nodes or here the left note, left hand notes, for example. So we, we evaluated this quickly, the data set, that we used already a while ago, 10 MIDI files from the Utopia project, so relatively high quality MIDI files, synthesized using a relatively high quality synthesizer, I think 20 gigabytes, multi-sample, whatever. Each recording was between 300 and 30 and 300 seconds long, nodes in le left and right hand were synthesized separately. The task is given the mix, separate the left from the right hand nodes. Networks, very standard, nothing fancy. Uh, standard feed forward networks, three layers, 1,500 units, sigmoid activations in between to get some non-linearity in there, relus, add representation output layers, optimizer, standard Adam, 
with just decreased with a slightly decreased step size. No normal dropout or batch norm or whatever tricks you want to do otherwise these days. Now full batch training on individual recordings. Yeah, so the ables were not constant, but yeah, as a piano roll essentially. Uh, evaluation just with BSS eval. And these are the results. Uh, so does this work at all? So we had an NMF baseline with 12, 12.4 or something decibels normalized by SDR gain, which is pretty high. Yeah, so it sounds all right. Now does this work? Yeah, I did actually something I shouldn't have done. I made a, a ULC. You should not do this. This is categorical data. You shouldn't do that. But I did it anyway. So it went down, yeah? So, um, great. But as you can see here from the axis, it's actually a very biased representation here. So you could also say it's on roughly the same level. But now we did two more things. We forced the second network to only use non-negative weight matrices. And what happens there then is that you essentially get something similar as going from independent component analysis to non-negative matrix factorization or something, you get a pure constructive representation of your learned uh, vector R. So you can only add something. You can never take anything back anymore. And I actually found a paper where they proved that this does not lower the representational power, actually, which I didn't think before. Then we an another small extension was adding some temporal context to it, which added a little bit as well. So maybe a small demo, which is actually an old version, but doesn't really matter. Um, oh. So this is essentially an interface around it, and the first step consists of essentially, first of all, aligning the score roughly with the audio recording using, for example, some stuff like seeing was working on. And so the, uh, the playback position should be roughly aligned. So then we created the binary label matrices, trained the networks, now you can not only separate the left and the right and you can of course just keep individual nodes as well. So we get a node object for all of these nodes. And once you can do that, you can for example do the following. You can click on the node and listen to the node separately. When you, once you know which part of the spectrogram or the recording actually belongs to each node, you can do, of course, whatever you want. So some demos, quick demos. For example, we can mute a node. Or you can pitch shift a node. You can pitch shift and time shift to make it sound horrible. Or because the score is structured, you can quickly select all the nodes in the left hand, for example, deactivate those nodes, and then we can do, for example, uh, as we did recently with the performance with Peter. where you can only play back the left or the right hand, in this case the right hand. So, yeah, just a quick demo. Uh, so, to the second part. And in this part, I wanted to emphasize this whole idea of using regularizers to enforce structure even more, or what I understand 
in the appropriate regularization. Because as soon as you start regularizing an optimization problem, often what you get is that it's sort of in machine learning theory, there's this idea of bias and variance in the error, classification error or regression error. It doesn't really matter. And um, the bias error is the error you're making independent of how big your data set is becoming. Yeah, so it's like a minimum error you're making, which can be caused, for example, by a lack of the classification power or because your regularizers express something you don't really mean or don't want. And appropriate regulariz regularizations is essentially a regularizer that lowers the variance, so it, gives, it does more of what you want without incre increasing the bias. So what that means, we will have a look at, uh, to, to explain that, we will look at music transcription, where the goal is given an audio recording to get some kind of score like representation. And that is a very difficult problem People have been working on that since the 70s, so a lot of people have looked into how we can actually get a chance to solve this, and inspired, for example, by other fields, some speech recognition, what they did uh, was going to speaker-dependent speech recognition, that means you have some calibration data for the speaker. For music transcription, you can do the same, so you have instrument-dependent music transcription, so you have a calibration data for the instrument of some sort. So with instrument dependent transcription, usually things are a bit lower, but by the way, ignore the numbers here, it's really, actually a uh, note here, it's just reported F measures, but sometimes, for some of these papers in particular, the neural network ones, they uh, use a different data set in everything, right? So it's not comparable. But just to give you a rough intuition where node error rates are. So this is one minus F measure. So it's not that great. Yeah? So although we know a lot about the recording and people have been working on this for decades, it's still not really there yet. So if you have node error rates between 20 and 30 percent, that's really bad. So I thought maybe we can do something about it. So I was thinking what, or what we were thinking, what can we do? And one thing you observe is that, from, first of all, now from a signal modeling point of view, one thing you observe is that most, or at least many methods, usually would explicitly or implicitly use frequency-only patterns to describe the patterns you want to detect, right? So for example, this might be the positions with this energy distribution uh, where you would expect energy when you're playing a C4 or something. Now the, third, now the idea is, to, for example, when you look at how the piano note really looks like, and you can't really see it here that well, but first of all, you have relatively non-stationary behavior, right? So you have this attack here, which is more or less broadband. You have this beating here, yeah? So it goes up and down. Some partials decay quicker than others. So the spectral energy distribution actually changes over time. And the energy decay is also quite characteristic. So why don't we, why do we just ignore that? should do that. So, all right, how do we implement this idea from uh, a modeling point of view? One thing we could just do is use all these spectral frames here and use that as patterns, but that leads to quite a few problems. So I thought, or we thought um, we need to do something about it, and one idea is, for example, to have some kind of Markov process governing which uh, templates in that know what you can use, right? Because you cannot just use the C4 onset with the sustained part after two seconds at the same time. That doesn't make any sense. So usually you, you are in some kind of silent state, and when there's an onset, you might play back, so to say, the first template, and then you have to do with some kind of minimum node length, and after a while, you can go back to silence or continue sounding. So the whole model was essentially that you had these 88 Markov processes governing where you are. They needed to scale up and down properly. And then the adding that together were the observation. OK, sounds all right. All right, like a signal model. Cool. Pretty close, maybe, to the physical the sound generation process, or how you think about it from a DAW perspective, so a digital audio workstation perspective. 
So how well does that work? Yeah, the ICAST paper. One problem was that this kind of model is usually only, th th there are some numerical methods for that, but they only really scale up to two to four or so parallel Markov processes. Up beyond that, you cannot really apply it. So we came up with something to do as much here jointly as possible, but it, let's see how well it worked. Um, so we were here. That was worth it, right? A lot of thinking and implementing and doing. So it was, if at all, slightly better, but not at all, really. So what's going on here? Why is this so difficult? I mean, in the end, our model is pretty close to the physical, physical a sound production process, because as soon as you know which patterns are there, you only need to scale it up and down, more or less. Um, so the whole process is linear. If it's a linear problem, how can it be so difficult? People have been working on this for 40 years. Why is this so difficult? Reason one. So I did, we did an experiment. OK, replace i with v every time. We did an experiment um, where we investigated the condition of music transcription. And condition analysis is something from system identification or system analysis theory. And what you essentially do is you try to identify some kind of linear system of equations, so AX equals B. And now what you want to find out, so B is the observation, right? And X is what you're looking for. Now, if you have some uh, noise in B, Condition analysis tells you how much this noise will be amplified in the parameter estimate x. And the only part of the whole thing that affects that is a. Right? So it depends on properties of a, how much the noise is increased. So in practice, a matrix is ill-conditioned if the columns or rows doesn't matter are more or less linear dependent, or close to being linear dependent. Now, why is that a problem? So what, what did I do? I, we, we essentially created, for musical piece, each pitch was sonified individually. So in each frame, we know exactly how the 88 keys come together. That is the A, so we had 88 rows, uh, columns, sorry. We want to know how strong is, are each of these active with a given observation, which is the mix. Now, I did that for entire pieces. Um, and then you find out that the condition number of these matrices, on average, are OK. But for about 20% or so, the condition goes through the roof. Because music is essentially designed to be as difficult as possible. Because you have these hum harmonicity is essentially, from a mathematical point of view, um, just a description for being linear dependent. Because you have all of these um, overlapping partials, so everything is correlated. Right? So from a really system perspective, uh, system analysis perspective, you can show that this is a really difficult problem. Second reason. So I did this thing with the 88 market processes. And then, as I already said, this was designed for two to three or four maybe concurrent streams, not 88. I tried to do as much as possible jointly. But what is happening? Let's say you have a stream for G4, and it, it's, but you only have a C4 in the, in the observation. The G4 might maybe explain some energy that is actually associated with the C4. Now, what, I kind of, what we kind of did was fixing most of the streams and updating only the other ones. But if the energy associated with the C is captured by the uh, G4, you cannot properly update it. Yeah? So you run into these weird local minima. So the whole parameter estimation process was just biased towards really bad local minima because things were not updated jointly. Yeah? So if you can, never do that. So second try. Same, more or less same model, expressed as a tensor now. So we have these time, fr uh, time frequency representation with individual nodes, still 88. We have 88 corresponding activity matrices which form a vector uh, tensor. And now, no Markov processes at the beginning at all. No constraints. Yeah? 
We just estimate entries here, completely free. So the task is now, so first of all, design goals, really everything needs to be soft. No hard decisions. Everything has to be as convex as possible to not run into bad local minima right at the start. Later on, maybe, but at the beginning, it, it, you shouldn't. And always encourage, never enforce. So let's have a look how that works. So these individual slides here, so this is a matrix, but these individual slides here are just put on top of each other to form a matrix, yeah, just for visualization. So for example, here, this here is the slice for the E4. So what do we see here? So this is this activity matrix we get when we have only two terms. And this is pretty much similar to standard non-negative matrix factorization. So we have a data fidelity term, so just the distance between the model and the given data, which is generalized to a glide graph. And then some non-negativity on these entries, just saying, OK, everything needs to be non-negative here. And this is what you get. Yeah? So what we, would be, what we would expect is this there's an onset that the first attack template will get uh, activated. And then we get some kind of diagonal line. Because in subsequent frames, the subsequent templates in the patterns are activated. Because it's, yeah, it's just time. Right? So it should be some diagonals here. That's completely messed up. So you get this noise up there. There, there. there are no nodes up there at all. This is completely blurry. You don't know if these are two nodes or uh, seven. So you cannot really do anything with this. So since it's a badly conditioned problem, the only thing we can do is applying regularization. Let's start with the most obvious one, L1 sparsity. So in L1 sparsity, we essentially penalize any activity using the L1 norm, and that clears things up nicely. Yeah? So this is like an optimized value. It could look worse, but this is the best I could get from that. And it's, it's cleaned up, right? But as we can see, there's still a lot going up on up there here as well. And one thing that's even worse, these things are not really diagonal. These are horizontal. Why is that? <coughs> it's quite obvious. So we have templates that are not normalized because we chose in, the, in, the, in this pattern to preserve the characteristic energy decay. That means that we are applying an L1 regularizer that to explain some energy, it makes more sense to activate the energy rich first templates because then you don't need so much activity energy to explain the same energy. But that means that here, for example, the wrong templates are used, which leaves residual energy, and that is that. Hmm. What do we do? So what we really want are diagonal structures. So we should encourage that. So we designed something that we call total direction variation. It's essentially a small variation of total variation, denoising terms used in image processing. It's essentially just what you're doing is you're applying um, a high pass filter along the diagonals, and the result of that is penalized. So high pass means any bigger change sudden change is penalized. And we will see how that looks like. So, and that cleans up things quite nicely. So, because if we have a horizontal structure, diagonally, that would be a, a massive, um, massive change from zero to something high up to down. So that is discouraged and it all vanishes. Same for high, uh, vertical structures for, I don't know, onsets or something, that, would, that is discouraged as well. So you get all these diagonal structures. And the nice thing so far is that you can show that all of these new five, five uh, terms uh, or regularizers are all convex. So wherever you start with the initialization, it will, you will always run into something that's kind of OK. Yeah? You don't run to a weird local minimum where everything is could be whatever. But if you're only doing convex stuff, it's also a bit simplistic. You don't really express what you want. For example, one problem we have here is, for example, this. This before is activated twice at the same time, which is physically impossible. 
right? So you cannot be in the sustained phase and at the same time already play the, the activity, uh, the, the attack pattern. So now we again introduced this Markov encoding again in a different form, but the intuition is the same, and that resolves the issue. So now we can ex express again that a node has to have a certain minimum length um, and has to follow this pattern here. But that's only really useful once we have a really decent initialization, which we get from the convex optimiza optimization. But we have still some problems. You might not see it. It's clear on the display there. Uh, OK, you can't see it at all. So here's some residual energy left. It's a bit. It's very low. But one thing is that the patterns we are using here are for nodes of average loudness. And if you change the loudness on a piano, it's not just scaling down. You change the pattern a little bit as, as well. So it's a bit nonlinear in a way. So that means if we have a node that is played softly, not only the activity goes down, but the pattern doesn't match so well either anymore. So the activity goes down even further leaving some residual energy here and here, for example. Now, what we added was one more regular, or well, another regularizer, which was essentially saying either an entry is zero or above a certain threshold, and then you can do whatever you want. What that does is with these entries, it's essentially stating, take this energy and putting it somewhere as best as you can into activities that are already there to explain the energy as best as you can. So what happens, for example, with a low intensity node is that all this energy is often collected into the proper, into the correct node, and then sometimes it was pushed above the detection threshold in a more controlled way. So this is, was essentially something for soft nodes. Still have problems. Because we, there's still, the patterns do not match perfectly. Some nodes are too long, because here was some residual energy and this is not strongly penalized if you just make it too long. But if you see it, actually, because the energy decay was fixed, so along the diagonals, we expect essentially no change at all. But here we get this drop. Yeah, suddenly here it becomes a lot weaker. So this is kind of wrong. So we design more regularizers that are even stricter. Uh, so two more, so that you can really properly express there shouldn't be any change along the diagonal. So this is already very non-convex, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. So overall, we get this. Yeah, so one optim function we need to minimize with a lot of different um, regularizers. And the thing is, so if you haven't seen this before, this is called the characteristic function. And it means that if the argument is in this set, so this is always a set, then the the value of that function is zero. If it is not in that set, the value is infinity. So it's either zero or infinity. But we need to minimize this. So some other stuff. This is highly non-differentiable. So not like the absolute value function or something is not differentiable at zero or something. This is highly non-differentiable. Yeah, infinity is value. Highly non-convex. How? We cannot apply gradient descent here. That's completely out of the question. So how do we minimize such a function? In this context, I really like this um, citation from Parikh and Boyd. So if you don't know it, don't know him. Boyd is like one of the most well-known people in optimization theory. They said, much like Newton's method, it's a standard tool for solving unconstrained smooth, so differentiable, optimization problems of modest size. Proximal algorithms can be viewed as an analogous tool for non-smooth, constrained, large-scale, or distributed versions of these problems. So everything we kind of need nowadays. So overall, proximal methods are actually one of the most important classes in optimization theory these days. And um, we don't have enough time to give you a proper separate tutorial today. I have some slides at the end, but you might be tired by then. But we, we can have a look. So it would be another 10 minutes or so. But I, I don't do it now. But let's see how much of a difference does it make. Yeah? So we have a signal model 
And it's kind of the same between both methods. It kind of just changed how we estimate the parameters. How much of a difference does it make? So now, just changing the numerics, we are here, 5%. So F measure is 95% now. So it does make quite a difference. If you're just, if you're taking the numerics into account, applying appropriate regularization in an informed way, so starting with convex stuff without adding too much bias and then adding more and more what you actually want to do. So um, this is, of course, very important in neural networks as well. So in general, understanding the numerics and behavior optimization processes are essentially at the very core of successful machine learning, whatever you do. Um, I hope, or at some point, Delia and Daniel will transfer more and more of these things to deep networks. But to conclude, um, so to say it again, understanding the behavior of optimization processes is really important for every application involving machine learning. And very important tools for that are regularization and relaxation. There's much more to it than L1 and L2, and it can make all the difference. Also in this context, proximal methods, very, very powerful. Um, I, I want to see if, who actually wants to hear more about that, but it's, it's really, really nice. So it essentially allows us to take the entire massive function we have there to completely take it apart and make it solvable. I, I, I might say more. But, yeah, okay, so references are used everywhere. So, thanks. <laughs> I guess we could do either, yeah, maybe some questions now and then we can still see who actually wants to see proximal methods. And everyone else can leave us, I think. Because it's, it's math, yeah. Yeah. I was a bit unclear as to whether your um, your Markov models that you spoke about, whether they were all trained as part of the same all the same procedure or whether they were something separate that you were including like as a template. It's it's it, it's a good thing. So in a way with the second method, it was still kind of separate because using these um, these proximal methods you essentially split up everything. But you split it up in a way that doesn't hurt the numerics. So it is, it is estimated separately, but in a more stable form. Um, it's a, the, the proper answer would be a bit more mathematical, I guess. But it's, OK, maybe I gave the impression that now all the Markov processes are done jointly. And they are, in a, from a certain perspective, they are, but then they aren't. So it, at least, so what is not happening anymore is like an expectation maximization where you fix something and update another one. With this, everything is synchronously. So you update everything and then merge back. And that's why it perfect. So proximal methods are usually used in MapReduce and other cluster distributed optimization problems because you have these. Distribute, merge, distribute, merge, and that is also called MapReduce. Okay. So did you get those, uh, those results from templates? They could have been learned from data where the partials are overlapping. Mm, yeah, and so in this, this case, they were just really recordings of single nodes at a specific ah. velocity. They were not learned. So that's this, OK, I didn't say that at all. The point. So the instrument dependent part of this is coming from the fact that we assume that for each key on the piano we have a recording of a single node. That is the calibration data. Um, yeah, good point actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the, talking about the, the regularization is really good. Um, you can make it a little bit more general by saying it's, it's how you design the cost function. You, know, you can start from is L2 error really 
thing you're trying to minimize in episode. Yeah, but, but it's you know, true. The lesson, true. Is, the lesson true. is true. Um, but, you know, I, I wonder what you can say to all of us about, like, what the limits on this are, you know? Because maybe <coughs> you can put all kinds of demands on your signal. Maybe I want, maybe I want this many prime numbers in the signal. Maybe yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I try to make it a bit more general, but it's actually a bit difficult, right? I mean, in the end, it boils down to what task you have, what kind of data it is, what, what, yeah, how linear or non-linear it is, all kinds of stuff. So, I think it's maybe the the most general or what more widely applicable thing is really just think about it. What can you do and learn from my mistakes? What you shouldn't. Like, uh, yeah, EM is often bad. So, like, uh, an approach is a, a way of thinking about it in a uh, slightly more traditional neural network terms is trying to put you at the right. Express your constraint as a differentiable cost function. We can, we can say as many yeah, sentences okay, as we yeah. like, but which, which sentences can we turn into a differentiable cost? Uh, and here you're saying it doesn't necessarily have to be differentiable, but it can at least be some sorts of numerical cost. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure if all of this would be applicable in your network context, because during the training, I mean, applying proximal methods is slower, or slow, slow. It's not as bad as MCMC or something, but uh, it's not as fast as, let's say, training an NNF model or something. It's slower. So if you would need to do stuff like this on each batch, I think that would, I don't know if it's that applicable. I mean, we use it, so the, the slide on proximal methods for neural networks I had at the beginning is actually in a completely different context. It's not about regularization, but um, um, just it's essentially a point about trying to prove that whatever cost function you're having, if you apply that method instead of stochastic gradient descent, the result will be better. But yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Maybe it's not as transferable as I would like it to be. So maybe just see it more as a case study or so. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in your cost function that you saw, uh, could you possibly solve this by having three shirts? Or, uh, I don't know, in the cases where you have uh, those um, non continuities to actually put very steep, very large, but still continuous? Could be an idea, um, but if you have very steep stuff, often it behaves very similar to having really zero infinity stuff, but it might help, yeah. So that might be a good idea to try out in for certain cases. In this case, I wouldn't even know how to do that, because these Markov, these characteristic functions on sets described by Markov process are really oddly shaped and yeah to smooth that out I don't know uh, maybe yeah hmm. maybe then you would need MCMC or something to uh, yeah, anyway. all right yeah so everyone can leave and uh, or does anyone want to see this, uh, these 10? Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. But don't feel bad. You can just leave. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> boring. It's mad. Uh, yeah. Also, in the next minute or so, just leave. It, it doesn't matter. So, okay. It is our problem. How do we solve it? And one thing we observe here is that we have a lot of individual terms, additive terms, right? Come back to that. So it would be much, so the idea is essentially of proximal methods, or in particular the, the so-called alternating directions method of multipliers is, 
this would be a lot easier if we could minimize these individually, right? So, um, for example, here this is um, zero or infinity. We would have no other constraints. We could minimize this very simply by just setting a to zero. Then this will be zero and done. Yeah? It would be a very trivial solution, but at least we would have a pretty clear way to solve this. But if we have it together with the kubak lava stuff up there, no idea. So how can we do that? So the alternating directions method of multiplier solves problems of the following type. Do we actually have some kind of pointer? No. So you have a function consisting of two parts. So the, the, the uh, upper function would be h, which could be defined as f plus g. And the variables are split into two parts, so x and z. Yeah, so we are trying to minimize over that joint. You could stack x and z together and form this h function, but that's how we look at the problem for now. And these two variables are connected to each other using this linear constraint. So these are matrices. So bx plus cz have to be c. OK, how is this useful? We don't know. But that's the kind of stuff ADMM does. So to understand this, or how to understand proximal methods in general, we transform it into something that's equivalent to this. And that is using uh, augmented or the Lagrangian multiplier formulation of this kind of stuff, or in this case, the augmented Lagrangian multiplier. OK, let's have a look at this. Looks odd, but it's simple. So, the actual objective function we're trying to minimize is just here. Yeah. So we have these two variables here. Okay. Then we have this constraint here, and we just take get the c on the other side. So bx plus cz minus c is equal to zero. And then we take that and put it here and here. Yeah. So here, this is just an inner product. 